We're now going to session seven. This is our final session of the day, US, China, and the innovation race. This panel will be broadcast and live streamed to our audience in San Francisco and to our Northern California members. Our speakers are Ganesh Iyer, Rui Ma, Katie Streethar, and moderating again is our chair, Gary Rochelle. Please join me in welcoming them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to whoever in this audience is the first one to hand me a business card that says Shaper on it. <laughs> um, yet, another, yet another job that I will never be qualified for, and that list is getting long and lo longer and longer every day. So the last panel of the day, and um, as you know, I've given a lot of chats about, a lot of talks about innovation in China. I think there's a couple elements to it that we want to drill down on today, and we have a great group of people to do that. So there's what's happening within China. There's the idea of competition for innovation and technology between the US and China. But there's also the rest of the world isn't sitting still. And one of the things that when you look at what Trisha just talked about, the immense energy resources required to power these systems are things that are gonna, you know, if, if a country's entering this world now, it's gonna have to totally revamp its energy infrastructure in actually order to support like a 20, second half 21st century uh, society around this. So that's one of the things, you know, we'll talk about. So with us today, I'll let each of the speakers introduce themselves very briefly, and then I'll kick off with some questions. So Ray, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Ray, and um, I'm currently CEO of a generative AI startup, so I guess I will talk a little bit about AI. Uh, but previously, I um, started Tech Buzz China, which is a tech media focusing on China tech, primarily directed towards uh, English-speaking investors. Actually, that is still running. I'm nearly consulting right now. Okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Ganesh Iyer. Um, I've been with a company called NEO. It's an electric car smart EV company right on the US operations. It's companies headquartered in Shanghai in China. Spent last eight years, I've been with them. Prior to that, I spent uh, almost five years working for this company, uh, who would remain nameless, called Tesla, working for the man himself. Um, so I spent my early days there, even the first car model was even launched. So I was there. So it's the last 13 years I've been spending mainly on the smart EV industry. So that's a little bit about my background. Prior to that, it's all technology side. Hi, my name is K.R. Sridhar. I'm founder and CEO of Bloom Energy. We produce on-site reliable power using a fuel cell technology for the Fortune 100, for other companies, but ultimately for distributed generation any, anywhere. But we also produce hydrogen electrolyzers that can make the molecule from the electricity as opposed to making the electricity from the molecule like natural gas or hydrogen. So what they didn't say, so first of all, they didn't, no one wants to be in a geopolitical panel. So we're gonna stay, they're gonna stay away from geopolitics. I won't necessarily promise to do that. Um, second thing is when you go through each of the backgrounds, so Ray is both a serial entrepreneur as well as a serial investor um, and has done work both in the US and China. So a really deep understanding of the core behind the innovation society in China the last, as it evolved the last 15 to 20 years. Ganesh, survived four and a half years with Elon Musk. And so he doesn't have a badge, but I think he just didn't bring it, because I'm pretty sure they give you badges if you survive four years working with Elon Musk, especially in the pre-production uh, you know, phase for the uh, Model S, which uh, you know, was a pretty heavy lift. And KR, while Elon had talks about going to Mars, KR actually was part of a team that put the uh, one of the rovers on Mars. And so we have a pretty diverse group of people here in terms of backgrounds to talk about uh, what we're doing with innovation. So first of all, I want to draw a couple distinctions. I want to draw the distinction between invention and innovation. And I think this is really important, especially when we're talking about the US and China. There is an obsession in the United States with invention. And so we're always looking for what is that next great thing? What is something that no one's ever thought of before? And when you look through history, there are notable examples of that. You could look at, you talk about Edison, you talk about some of the things that Henry Ford did, Alexander Graham Bell and so on. But the sad fact is, is that invention captures 10% of the value of a successful invention or product. Innovation captures the other 90%. Innovation is dependent upon how rapidly you can turn the cycle time 
on that original product and improve it. And that's one of the things that we're gonna start talking about right now um, is how well China does that in particular. Um, and one of the things I wanted Ganesh to talk about initially is since you were instrumental at Tesla, but also now at NIO, kind of walk us through what's the mindset for the Chinese consumer? What's the mindset at NIO in terms of how you bring new products, services, technologies to market? Oh, sure, absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned in my brief intro, um, so I've been in this so-called automotive or smart EV industry for the past 13 years. I was strongly, strongly, strongly discouraged by my mentors to join Tesla back in 2011. So they said, you know, there's nothing called gross margin in automotive industry. It's a cash cow, right? Money grows in. When I joined, I realized that it's not an automotive company. It's a technology company on steroids. So the fundamental difference that I saw transitioning out of Tesla into uh, my current company, NIO, is that usually many of the, you know, the, the inventions are centered around the product. You know, product becomes the universe. And then, of course, the customers or the consumers or the users of the product um, Many say it's, a, it's core, but it's an afterthought. But our mindset, what attracted me to join uh, from Tesla to Neo is that it's truly a user enterprise driven company. So user is a key word in anything and everything we do. So that's something that excited me. You know, how does that matter? So in the context of EV, there is a term called SDV, software defined vehicles. And I asked myself, software cannot define the vehicle. It is a user experience that drives that innovation and then the change. That was the main reason for me to leave Tesla to join this company, right? So in terms of what specific inventions or the innovations are coming from China in, in, the, in the EV industry, I can speak quite a bit. Uh, first and foremost is, you know, ask ourselves why the EV adoption is still relatively low in the whole entire global market, while China is, is one of the leading factors. So it's all around the concern around the, the range anxiety, potential battery degradation, you know, that's, that's a uh, common mis uh, misconception. How can we solve that? Um, you know, there was an invention called battery swapping that was done back in 2007, I believe, by an Israeli-based company called uh, um, Better Place. Mm -hmm. So they are the first one to, um, you know, invent, um, I would say, that the battery swapping can be a viable. But why the company miserably failed? Because it's like putting a horse in front of the cart, so to speak. So we took that principle at heart. We said, what is again impeding the broader adoption? It's a concern around the battery. The single most expensive component in any smart, any EV uh, brand, regardless of which company it makes, is overall price or the cost of the battery itself, the battery pack. How can we solve that? Well, we, we didn't have any legacy. We went back to the drawing board. I said, you know, we need to provide an entire um, power replenishment ecosystem for the consumers of their choice. So we came up with something called chargeable, swappable, and upgradable, an entire end-to-end -end power replenishment system. Some of the other EV players in the early, including Tesla, I would say, focus mainly on the chargeable aspect, which is okay because countries like United States and Europe, where population density is relatively lower as compared to that of China, India, and other places. So there's not much real estate. So we have to give that you know, innovative way of charging the EV. So the core innovation is battery swapping. That's what we focused on. Said, you know, what does premium mean in the context of smart EV? It is no longer, you know, black leather interior and then chrome plated notes. It's the time. Time is a new premium. How can we give the time back to the users for charging experience? And we launched our battery swapping innovation coming out of China back in 2018. And as I speak here right now, we have done over 36 million successful swaps. That means every 1.2 seconds, a battery has been swapped on a new vehicle, predominantly in mainland China, but it's in five countries in Europe as well. We didn't stop there. Can we actually now innovate even more, come up with a new business model? Again, this innovation, I'll give kudos to my CEO, again, coming from China. So. Um, smart EV is very expensive. Electric vehicles are expensive in general. That means only the rich segment of the user profile can afford it. Well, how do we shift that needle to more of a middle class people who don't have as much purchasing power? Well, we just invented battery swapping is, is a viable alternative for swapping the, the battery quickly in less than three minutes. So we said, why can't we separate out the car as a two separate transaction? The you know, body without the battery. 
You buy the car without the battery, and then you subscribe to the battery. But it's, it's not a novel concept, but if you look at, uh, in, the, in the context of the whole world is moving as a service model, so we created a battery as a service as a new innovative business model. Today, as I speak, more than 80%, 85% of the new sales are coming from the battery as a service model. So we have been able to drastically not only lower the, uh, the purchase price for those middle class potential buyers, and also give them faster charging infrastructure at scale. So that's, you know, I'm extremely proud of that innovation coming from China, especially from uh, the company that I represent. The rest of the world has to learn, I know, how to push that innovation through the rest of the world. Okay, that's really, so we'll get back, we'll get back to that and uh, the EV market. So Ray, so you've now started a new company, part of a, or part of a new startup. What's the journey from what you were doing in China as an investor and uh, entrepreneur to doing this company now in Silicon Valley? Oh, what's the and how would, And how do you think about, mm -hmm. how do you think about the two locations in terms of starting an AI-based company here in the Valley now? Uh, yeah, so, well, I was in China from 2007 to 2015 and um, worked in investing there, actually in a couple of different industries, not just tech and real estate media, which is highly restricted, much more restricted than tech, and then tech itself. Um, and uh, I think I still keep uh, tabs on a lot of cross-border transactions. I actually um, still angel invest. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about AI that is very different, I think, from a lot of the trends in, in past years is that you see a much larger crop of Chinese entrepreneurs who are trying to go global from day one, right? So, and part of the reason is, um, you know, I won't go into the details like the last presentation of, of like how maybe AI is, is working, but that was sort of a consumer uh, yes. demonstration, but actually uh, most of the value is being unlocked in um, enterprises, right? Or maybe prosumer, higher value uh, transactions. And one of the things we were discussing earlier during the break is that China has a very weak demand for enterprise software. Um, there are many reasons. I think we came up with at least uh, seven or eight between the three of us, uh, all very, very valid reasons. But I, as I was doing research for this panel earlier, like one, just to give you a sense of scale, um, one of the larger sort of legacy enterprise software companies, Kindy, is only like $6 billion in market cap, right? That's, that's very, very small compared to the uh, enterprise company, software companies we would have listed in the US or UK or any number of other exchanges. And um, so I think like what's happening now is that while on the invention level, um, US obviously with this newest uh, age of AI, generative AI is sort of the uh, leader um, and, and China is very fast uh, making its own follow on uh, large language models, the foundational models uh, that you saw earlier. Um, China has four unicorns in that space right now and a couple of others um, in related, but at least four AI unicorns uh, in the foundational layer uh, space. And uh, you see that basically um, on the application level though, there's much, much more revenue um, happening abroad outside of China. In fact, there are like two of the more um, you know, AI companies are only, generative AI companies really, like ours, only a year old or so. Two of the companies that have uh, more than eight figures of annualized revenue, uh, and, and there's, there's maybe like a, a few dozen of these um, are from China, and, but you can see at least one of them, and this is, this is public, uh, a company called Heijin, um, team primarily based in China, uh, raised money from Sequoia, China, uh, and recently, um, kicked out Neil Shen, I think, as their board member and converted to a you know, totally US structure because they find that all of their revenue is coming from the US. And uh, they're now um, seeking follow-on investors exclusively from the US. So I think this is something that's a little bit different um, for the AI space that you don't really see happening um, with other sectors or more legacy sectors, right? In e-commerce and traditional mobile internet, what you typically saw was uh, 
uh, in e-commerce specifically, you see companies, um, the large platform companies in China expanding abroad, or maybe a company like Xi'an um, taking supply chain advantages and exporting it abroad, but ultimately um, they're really, really taking advantage of um, core, uh, core manufacturing advantages in China. But with AI, the invention, right, so-called invention technology is actually US and also the market is US. It's just the engineering talent or the leadership itself uh, that might have been you know, Chinese uh, born or China based for the moment. It's interesting. So Ke uh, Kai Fu Li in his um, book, a uh, AI Superpower, one of his fundamental uh, premises was that China would have a huge advantage in data that the amount of data um, in China would actually allow it to uh, exceed or leapfrog what the U.S. had. And part of that was tied to the consumer, the study seated on consumer data because the e-commerce market, payments markets are all very large there. How do you, th how do you reconcile those two things, um, given what you were just saying in terms of entrepreneurs in China saying the revenue looks like it's coming from overseas initially? H how are those two things going to reconcile, especially if and I won't ask you to comment on the uh, U.S.-China uh, side. I'll, I'll comment on that later. But it's not going to be smooth sailing in terms of just an open market where technology is going to flow back and forth, I think, in the next, next several years. No. I mean, yeah, not a geopolitical expert, but it's very clear that uh, at least on the foundational uh, model level that China has uh, no intent to rely on US technologies, right? So they're really trying to home grow. Actually, I, I was looking at on my phone at the beginning of the session because I want to make sure I get the number right. But uh, in October of last year, there's this report that said um, China had nearly quadrupled its number of large language models um, from about 70 to almost 200. Uh, was, I think the exact number is 238 um, in just four months. Right, so there are a lot of people uh, working on AI technologies in, mm -hmm. in, in China right now. Now they're not as good as, uh, again, what we have here cutting edge. Um, I think the latest that was released by uh, one of the unicorns, Zhipu, is um, they openly say that they're 90% as good as GPT-4. Um, but you know, GPT-4 is like half a year old. <laughs> so so um, anyway, the, uh, I think for how to reconcile what Kai Fu said, um, it's funny, uh, I think overall, no one in China that I talked to uh, with, yeah, pretty much no one in the industry really believes that China is number one in AI generally, only in specific subfields. So I think what Kai Fu, had, Kai Fu said could be uh, true for fields like you know, like the payment data, machine learning for fraud, for example, mm -hmm. or uh, facial recognition, uh, for example. So sort of, again, the previous generation of um, AI that had very different, you know, technological paradigms uh, versus generative AI where really you're coming through the whole internet, right? Uh, so the level of data that we're talking about is still different. Um, it can also, he can also be right in the future for other applications of AI. So one of the more popular um, areas where entrepreneurs are spending a lot more time and are getting a lot more funding than here in uh, the US is embodied AI, right? Where AI is, you're using generative AI, but you're also using it to interact with the physical environment. Um, yeah, you mentioned robotics in particular was the yeah area that's exactly. Although I actually just did look up the VC funding last year, and the U.S. did still exceed China in robotics, but it was primarily because of a few, I think, healthcare like very high capex surgical yeah. robots. Yeah, the auto <laughs> the, the auto doc, you know, yeah. types of things. So, so the first two you know panelists, you know, Ganesh talked about cars. So it takes years to develop a car and put it in the manufacturer facility. You know, Ray talks about now we're in the AI side of chat GPT for five, 12, 18 months. Now we go to something that's really hard. And what KR did when uh, he launched Bloom Energy, um, which was 22 years ago, yeah. 23 years ago, um, he dealt with a new material and a new form of generating electricity. And um, so I'm going to ask uh, KR to talk about when we think in time frames of invention and we in time frames of innovation, the energy sector trumps everything else 
in terms of just the sheer scale and difficulty of that. But none of these other happy things we're talking about, charging our cars at night and running large language, are going to exist if there's enough energy. So KR, maybe you'd like to offer some comments in that regard. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And let me sh give a shout out to Gary Rishal. Your leadership in building US-Asia relationship and being the chair and running Asia Society, thank you. OK, that's a bot that <laughs> Tricia put up on the stage to say that. So can the real KR please come out? So, thank, thank you very much. No, I truly mean it. It's, 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 it's awesome. Look, uh, I think, Gary, you're asking the right question. Um, energy, at the core of it, there is nothing since you got up this morning that you could have done in, the, in your normal course of work if energy didn't exist in some form or, or another. The water in the faucet would not have come for you to brush your teeth or use the toilet. Okay, so everything that you do, the fact that you're able to see me is there are electrons, uh, you know, shining photons that come to my face and reflect to you, and that wouldn't happen without electricity. So everything we talk about takes energy. And we're in a unique place right now in energy transition in the world. And it's not just in any country, right? It's particularly meaningful for emerging economies because there is no country that's energy rich but economically poor. There's no country that's economically poor that's energy rich. They're directly correlated. So it gets into the heart of national security, economic security, well-being. And for the first time in the industrial age, Gary, even in developed countries like the US, availability is becoming the key issue. Availability, reliable availability of energy. You can just look at me and say, what are you talking about, right? The, we launched an energy transition the way I try to tell people when we try to shut things off before new things come on, which, which gets to your question on invention to innovation to commercialization and affordability, right? Is we are flying a plane. The plane's called human civilization, human development, human well-being. We have to swap engines while we are flying it because we can't stop it for a little while to keep flying. And there are people advocating, we shut the engine off before the new engine is ready. OK, that's what's going on. So if you just look at the US, we have retired 290 gigawatts worth of electricity generation in the country by shutting down nuclear and coal. Okay. We have added 250 gigawatts of renewables at a rapid pace. It's, an, it's a fabulous thing. It's good for the planet. But 250 gigawatts of renewable give you about 100 gigawatt equivalents of base load power that these things give over 24 seven. So we have a deficit of 150 gigawatts over the last 10 years in this country. In the meanwhile, what happens the last 40 years the CAGR of demand growth in the country has been 0.5%. Okay? EVs alone will require a 6 to 8% growth. AI will require 6 to 10% growth. Electrification of everything in the homes will require another 8 to 10% growth. And if we take industries and try to, industrialize, uh, to electrify it, it'll take 100% growth. We have a 40-year history of doing 0.5%. We have dropped our generation. And we have not, we have not built transmission distribution infrastructure. That's America. Then you go to emerging economies. And I'll speak about India since I know that better than uh, China. So let me speak to that, right? There are 350 million people between the ages of 0 to 14 equivalent of the US population. They're getting educated, they're ambitious, they have to grow, okay? And it's equally distributed almost between male and female, 185 million to 165 million. We got the demographics, and I was just recently there. 
it looks like what it felt like when you visited China about 25, 30 years ago. Little towns are getting infrastructure, roads are getting built, airports are coming, planes are coming in places where people haven't seen planes other than in the sky. Things are changing, right? Just think about that 1.4 billion population. Last 20 years, it's been growing at 7.7%. Let's assume that it's only 5% averaged out for the next 20 years. They'll have to double their energy use. Now let's get to the timeline for invention to innovation to uh, commercialization. Cambridge has done a study of all energy technologies. The median time to commercialize something and make it viable is 40 years, four zero. Okay, Loom's trying to do that in 30 years and that'll be a record. That'll be at the lower end of what we do. So if you're hearing if you're opening your Scientific American and reading this great, or popular science and reading this great invention, think about the median age it takes to impact it. So this is the energy construct. And you're not going to have leadership in any field if you don't have security of energy. So therein comes the issue of what, what is competition and energy mean? In the short term, it means going and securing as much energy as you can from whoever you can to build your country. This is why countries like China and India still work with countries that we think we should, they shouldn't be working with because they don't have the luxury like US of being endowed with all these energy assets, right? Midterm, both these countries realize Fossil fuel will be there only for the so long and they need to transition. They're making a great job on renewables. And if I take India again as an example, uh, I was there speaking to three different CEOs who all have two-wheeler industries, Hero Motors, Honda in India and TVS. Between them, 60% of two-wheelers. I'll tell you in the next five years, there will not be a single two-wheeler that consumes oil in India. It'll all be electric. That's going to happen at a lot faster rate than cars are ever going to happen mm -hmm. in India. And so for them to figure out that innovation chain and do what they need to do and then be able to export to the, you know, Africa and other places, that's a play for them. That's a relevant play for them. Uh, you, you look forward to 2050, the competition is going to be the molecule, how to make hydrogen. Using, using renewables. But if you don't sow the seeds now, given that 40-year time frame, you're gonna mess up. And these countries have wisened up, so China will have a huge investment in hydrogen infrastructure. So will India, so will the US, and that's the competition. So when we're, so going back to the fundamental premise of the panel, which was you know, about innovation in the US and China, if we look at, if we look at that, the idea behind um, invention and then innovation. You know, recently, even our current president said 10 years ago that China couldn't innovate, and I think we've kind of set that to bed, that that's not true. But how do we think, and I'll start with, start with Ray and then, and then go to uh, Ganesh, how do you in your experience think about China as a place that can invent? And the in innovation in the consumer side, looking at Xiaomi, looking at what you know, Neo has done, that cycle, when, when, you have in, when you have something and then it's a question of incremental improvement, the Chinese have done a phenomenal job of that. But if we take a step back and look at the, the core of invention, how would, you, how would the two of you and then KR about India, how would you think about the capabilities that exist today in China and the ability to do that and execute on that? I think it's a lot better than before because before the uh, society is so poor that you know a large part of it is about catching up and getting to you know so-called middle income status, but I think that the, the 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 sort of like learning I would say is just because uh, an invention is was not made in China does not mean China can't invent. So there's a there's a big difference. So like a, a very simple example I like to use is like. Uh, uh, people uh, in the past, I guess less so now, would say, uh, you know, Chinese developers don't know how to make anything, they just copy. 
And if you actually work in the Chinese uh, companies, their reasoning tend to go like this. It's very practical. Uh, it's not whether or not I uh, can or cannot make that thing. It's like if it has already been made and it is open source, for example, why, do, why should I make a more original solution for the sake of being original than just take something that has already been working? Now, sometimes that extends to uh, you know, uh, methods maybe that, that are not as, uh, not as clean as you know, just using open source software. But you basically see what has happened is when the incentives change, then the inventiveness um, uh, grow, right? So uh, well, taking open source, for example, uh, software as an example, uh, in the past, um, like 10 years ago, there were very few contributors from China. But once it became um, a commercial KPI, right? It was like, for example, Alibaba made it like for some of their departments, a KPI for people to publish open source software and you know get uh, you know GitHub stars or whatever it is uh, that their exact KPI is. I'm not really sure, but then you see a lot more contributions. So what I would say is right now, I think the market forces in general still reward the innovation, or I guess innovation we're describing as sort of the scaling up part, much more robustly than it does the invention, which you yourself had mentioned was just 10%. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I think that we don't see as much over there. But once the um, you know, knobs are turned a little bit, then you see more. For example, uh, I'll throw in one more anecdote. Um, it's a little relevant to energy is like patents in China. Before, again, a lot of the Chinese patents are because of this sort of fake KPI where the more patents you have, the more bonuses you get inside your company or you get special uh, you know, citizenship bonuses in certain cities. Uh, but the uh, Chinese company with like, I think the most number of patents um, is China Grid, actually the state grid. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably they're not all uh, related to energy. There are probably some other things. Uh, because I actually was just looking up AI patents, and it is uh, like one of the top 10 contributors even for AI patents. Um, but again, I think that is because, uh, you know, I don't know about the usefulness of the invention, but because there are certain incentives in society or in that corporation itself to be inventive. You learn early in the sales game, you do get what you pay for. So if yes, you're setting exactly. the incentives a particular way, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. So Ganesh, you have an interesting view of Tesla and Neo. Yeah. And how do you think about when you when you hear people say, well, the Chinese can't innovate or, you know, the innovation and, you know, Tesla really was far more innovative than the Chinese firms. And you're sitting where you sit today. How do you think about that? Yeah, before I comment on that, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate, lucky and weird in the sense that born in India. In which order? <laughs> I'm bo lucky part first. <laughs> Born in India, I came to the United States in 93, so the last 30 years in the US. When I look back, I said, I've traveled, um, last night I was counting, you know, looking at my passport, when does it expire? I said, holy cow, number of pages, I flipped through it. I said, I have 37 stamps landed in China. Then I added the number, I said, I spent more time in China than I went to India since I've been in the United States. So that's the, you know, different dynamics. So every time I travel to China, it's my personal view and my personal experience, and when I come back, my respect for the country, the citizen, the infrastructure, and the speed of innovation just went up by tenfold, at least tenfold, every single time. I see that's fascinated. You know, this morning, one of the panels talked about, I think it was the, the, the Indonesian uh, representative mentioned about the high-speed train that was built. Yeah, it's expensive. But in this country, even in India, we're still talking about it. But China, it's already done. I felt it in, in, in less than seven minutes from Shanghai downtown to the airport. It was like, Acceleration, deceleration before you can enjoy it, right? It's, it's not a myth, it's reality. So what I have seen experience is the speed of execution with unparalleled, with unparalleled from my perspective, what I have seen it. Be it on the infrastructure side, be it on the technology side, be it on the innovation side, all of that. In the context of uh, you know, automobiles, for example, traditionally it takes about minimum four to five years to produce a brand new car from a conceptual drawing on a napkin to the car coming off the end of line. Take any, any, any brand, it takes about four to five years. 
we launched the first car. Even I thought, I've never done a car. I said, you know, hey, we can do this in two years. We can do this in less than three years. It's not like saying it. The first car in your ESA it was produced three and a half years. Some shortcuts are taken. The last car that came out of during COVID in one year, conceptual drawing to production car coming out of Neo ET5. Those of you who are interested, I'm driving. It's one downstairs. You can check it out. And the factory was built during COVID. Factory was built during COVID in less than 365 days. Groundbreaking to the, so the speed of innovation and the execution is something that I think, from my perspective, I've seen. I think the rest of the world have to learn how China is doing that. Yeah, I think that, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to the end to summarize things. So, KR, one thing I'd like you to comment on this, not necessarily right in your wheelhouse um, in terms of what Bloom does, but uh, ultra long haul energy transmission, um, or uh, ultra, and I guess that's the right way to describe it. China's had a huge investment in that area. When you think about grid capability in places like India or other developing countries, how important is that ultra long haul transmission of energy going to be? compared to the traditional grid structures we've dealt with in the past? Um, my, my personal view is the ultra long haul doesn't work for most countries in the world because of energy security, because of how strongly cyber is connected to the future grid and pure security issues. You know, the future wars will be fought on turning your power off and not mm -hmm. about putting boots on the ground. So there is a national security element that prevents you from doing those things in a meaningful way. If we fought for water, and we still do, coming out of rivers, give me a break. Yeah. That ain't happening. You know, that's utopian on a piece of paper. It's not happening, right? But the grid existing in a big way is a flywheel that energy needs. So the grid will exist. And that can be made a lot more efficient. How do you, in a modern world where, you, God forbid, we were in a surgery room, a robot is going to conduct the surgery with digital data. And if there is no power, a doctor is not going to know how to perform that surgery. That's the future of medicine. Uh, Self-driving cars are going to paralyze on a street if data is not available. So electricity being off is not an option. So that reliability factor has to go to a much higher level. And the only way you secure that is using microgrids and macrogrids. So microgrids are where the future is with making the grid a lot better in terms of transmission distribution because renewables need to come from there. It's that combination is how I see it. And uh, Sorry, let, let me just interrupt, because I think that that's right. I mean, I, the part of the reason I brought that up is when uh, Ray brought up the number of patents at like um, yeah. state grid, southern grid, a significant number of those are due to long haul transmission of energy, which has disappeared from the Chinese discussions on energy yeah. about four years ago, for I think many of the reasons that you just talked about. Because yeah. they realize if they can shut off someone's grid, someone can shut their grid off, and this is not a yet. From a security perspective, it just doesn't make sense. Given That's the, one, right? But, yeah. but think about the other. If electron coming to your premises, whether it's home or companies, is the lifeblood for everything you do, knowing everything you know about climate change that's already baked in, but with more violent storms, hurricanes, typhoons, yeah. uh, more wildfires, more hot days, more cold days, would you design a piece of wire on a pole being the way you get that lifeline delivered to you? Which one of you would, right? So, so, yeah. so we need to think differently about it. So we're gonna have, we have 10 minutes for questions. So I'm gonna see, Mark, you got yours up quick. So we'll go to Mark Cohen first and then Get, who, any, everyone else get their questions ready? Yeah, I can't so, see. So, so this question is primarily uh, directed to Ganesh. Um, I, while you were talking, I looked up the PTO website, and your company has about 400 patents in the US, 428, uh, which, by the way, is four times state grid, which is an interesting phenomenon for state grid. A little bit on the side there, state grid files a lot in China, yeah. very little in the US, very typical for state-owned enterprises. 
Why are they innovating if they have a monopoly? It's an interesting question people find. What is equality? Hard to say, but Neo is an interesting profile because it looks like you're innovating all over the world. I saw in the patents in, uh, inventors in Germany. I saw yep. several from different places in the US and of course China, largely in Anhui, which itself is a cluster for battery technology. Yep. So we hear a lot in the US, particularly in EVs, that the US can invent, but we can't manufacture. Mm -hmm. And that if you, you have all these great ideas that are ultimately being applied primarily in China, manufactured in China. So I'm wondering how you view the ecosystem and the challenges facing the US to compete in this area or just to innovate in this area and contribute back to China. Because that looks as if, you're just reading the patents very quickly, yep. only a few of them, that looks at, a little bit like what Neo is doing. Yeah, great question. So actually it's uh, for our battery swapping uh, business, we have over 1400 patents, approved patents. It's not even 400, it's 1400 patents. Extremely proud of that innovation that's coming out. It's, um, to KR's point, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that directly. So even, even the fourth generation battery swap station that we just deployed, it is bi-directional. Um, it has 23 battery packs fully loaded. We can do roughly about 480, close to 80 swaps per day per station today. Imagine a situation where the battery swap station is idle. I can give the energy back to the grid mm -hmm. and then draw it when you need it. So it's like an energy asset. Right, it's the coolest invention you can ever think of, right? Why didn't the rest of the world think about it? Why didn't the rest of the world think about it? So, you know, keeping again, I, I promise that we won't bring the geopolitical thing, but uh, to me personally it is, innovation has no religion, innovation has no country of origin, innovation has no barrier to entry. You know, the complex world that we all live in, we have enough issues to deal with. We all think what COVID did to us, just wait for it this thing called you know, the global warming. The impact would be much, much worse. So what I would like to see is, you know, in, in, in the context of why the, the US you mentioned is, I would like to see regardless of the political, cultural, all of those barriers, let's collaborate. If you think you have invented something better than I did, let's build a relationship, let's go and then solve the problem together for the rest of the world. So that is the only way I see that this thing all working. Otherwise, it's always, I think, um, Personally, I view that the entire world is looking up to see how to slow China down. I think I've heard a number of panels this morning. That has been an emerging theme. Even some of the survey results that we saw, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's alarming, but it's interesting. But I think I would like to see that change. It should be a, a global issue, not just China and United States issue. That's the only way I see personally moving this needle to the right for a better you know, tomorrow for our children, grandchildren, and others to live. Okay, the US manufacturer. Are we only going to be the place to invent? Absolutely, why not? I, hope so. I mean, it, 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 the labor cost is the one factor. That's right. mainly the reason, right? Somebody earlier said it's 80% of the quality at a 60% cost or something in those ratios. So that's the reason why many of us are um, looking at potentially China to do the, you know, because they build the ecosystem, the supply chain, the whole nine yards. Do you want to reinvent it? And it's relatively cheaper. But now, because of the political reason, now other regions are becoming mini hubs of creating that manufacturing hub, mini hubs in other parts, India included. Thank you. Yeah. Question? So, okay, someone in the back over there? Mr. McGregor, is that Jim? Okay. All right, let's make this geopolitical. Um, <laughs> now I, I wanna ask about talent. Um, you know, America's had this wonderful innovation because of the talent of the world comes here we have two people from India and a person from China on stage talking about innovation, um, where our policies have gone in, in, in recent years, as we all know, um, uh, it's hard for people with STEM talent to get visas to come. We're scaring professors out. What is the future of that? I mean, we've had a, a nice run here in America because we've been open to talent from around the world and we've become kind of paranoid and, and worried about everybody from outside. Will other countries start to surpass us you know, in five, 10, 20 years because the talent will be going elsewhere or staying at home? Ray, do you want to take a shot? Just each of you take a sure. shot at that? Sure. Um, well, I know that Tsinghua University, uh, from where I have a degree, just put out a report that said something like 86% of their alumni go back to China or just stay in China to work. Um, actually, the number might be higher. I don't remember exactly what the number was. 
uh, I think that uh, there has been a lot of uh, um, reports on, uh, like very recently, about how um, PhDs in STEM uh, from China were stopped at the border and were not allowed to continue their research here. I think that is definitely a loss for the US. I don't know that China is really picking up talent, though. So I think it's really just uh, us stabbing ourselves in the foot repeatedly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, our, it's our game to lose, yeah. So look, uh, as we sit here, Congress and the White House are trying to figure out a budget plan. There is no single policy that has zero costs and gives so much to the country than immigration. Net, net, it, it is a positive. Uh, and I think the reason it is stuck is because we have combined talent migration and comprehensive immigration together in one bucket. And neither party has the political will to separate it out and do what's right for the country. This country was built to where it is today because of a steady stream of immigrants. I don't think the future will be any different if we still want to have our position in the world. Ganesh, do you want to add? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, I like storytelling. Um, now speaking to one of the I would say the greatest economist from India, Dr. Subramanian Swami. Uh, you know, but he was educated in Harvard University, uh, PhD in economics and event. So he was here in the Bay Area probably about five years ago. I was lucky enough to be in this. So he asked, India wants all of you back, the, the Indian innovators and the, the so-called smart people who are in this country, we need you back. You know, he said, you know, India doesn't know how to build the roads between Chennai to Mumbai. The Indians know how to ro build the road in Iraq and Saudi Arabia, or places that have been there. Why is that? Why is that? I said, there are two reasons from my perspective. One is why I came to this country after my schooling and whatnot is one is, um, it's a freedom. Access to capital is there for invention, much easier. Why there is, uh, you know, the, uh, the Sand Hill Road exists? Because there's so much capital there easily available if it's a good idea. If it's a good idea, there are people behind it. So. Um, but also alarming was this morning in the panel mentioned, and there's only uh, 330,000 you know, Chinese students who are studying in the United States, and the reverse is now much lesser. I mean, he said 5,000, but the professor uh, Scott from Stanford, he was sitting at my table, he said it's only 800 or something. It's much small, which is ridiculous. I think we need to bring in the talent at a global pool as opposed to resting to you know, country of origin, et cetera. So, so that's, that's my... Personal, yeah. Talent is a problem, but it, talent, enough talent exists, but we need to collaborate more to bring in to solve common issues and problems. Yeah, that, the immigration issues would be a, an entire day or week or month. month. Um, I've never heard, I've never been so frustrated in all the meetings in DC as when the issue comes up about uh, foreign students coming to the United States, and it uh, primarily focused on China. And the comments like, well, what if some are spies? And these come from senators. These don't come from idiots. Yeah. Right. Well, OK, hold on. <laughs> and so, and so I, I, I append the last comment. But, but I mean, the idea, the idea that you can look at the entire history of this country, you look, you look at over 70, 65 70% of the CEOs of AI companies are immigrants. I mean, it does not take a rocket scientist, no offense, KR, to, to actually look at this and say, we have a serious problem, and if we want to be successful going forward on these very long-term intensive competitions, you have to have the best and brightest people in the world wanting to be here. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be the end of things. I want to thank our panel for the conversation, and thank all of you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Margaret. Margaret. Thank you so much. That was a perfect way to end yeah. our conference. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And you know it's a good day when Gary wears a tie. Thank you, you've been a really terrific audience. We hope you learned some new insights, you met new friends and contacts. This concludes part eight of our Seeking Truth Through Facts US-China series, which we started back in July. And we still have many, many programs to cover, so stay with us. All of our videos will be up on our website. Thank you to our fantastic speakers, many who traveled here to spend the day with us, to our fantastic and dedicated sponsors, and to our team. 
our staff, our interns, and our volunteers. Let's please hear it for our team. Nina Utagawa for taking the lead, Man Wong, Christy Young-Smith, Jason Fong, and Aaron Rowakan. There's been hours of rehearsals and preparation. Our uh, volunteers and interns, thank you so much again. You are so talented. We host monthly programs in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, virtually, and now in Seattle, our new center there. So please do come join us. We make a lot of them uh, available to both audience. Join us as a member. And on behalf of the Asia Society Northern California, thank you for coming out today.